Hello and welcome to Cells Part 3. Okay, so let's talk about the plant cell. So I'm going to give you a little scenario here. Your friend asked you to watch her plants while she went away for the summer. And you know that the plants need plenty of light and water, so you put them in the window um, and you water them. But maybe one day you get home from, like, from work or you forget and you don't water the plant. So today turns into tomorrow. Tomorrow a few days have passed and suddenly you look at the plant and you see that it's kind of wilty and deflated looking. So even though the plants are wilting, you notice that they still, like the, the, the plant itself and the leaves still look roughly the same shape. So you think, okay, there's still hope. With a few extra days before your friend comes back, you start to water them again. And pretty soon the plants perk up in no time and it looks great before your friend gets back. So you got lucky. If you ever stop to wonder why plants don't completely collapse when you forget to water them or they can go that long without water and then get back to looking um, like their beautiful selves again, there's a reason for that. Plant cells share a lot of components um, with the cells in your own body, like DNA in the nucleus, an endoplasmic reticulum, etc. However, plants have some original cell components that are different than what is in yours and mine cell. So um, plant cells have chloroplasts that help turn light energy into food. And today we're going to talk about plant cell walls, chloroplasts, and vacuoles in particular, and how these help the plants um, to have their unique attributes. Okay, so there's another microscope picture of one. Okay, so plant cell walls. All plant cells have a plasma membrane, just like an animal cell, which provides the same barrier that regulates transport in and out of the cell. However, plant cells also have a specialized structure called a cell wall. The cell wall is a protective layer surrounding the cell on the outside of the plasma membrane. The cell wall can be up to 800 times thicker than the plasma membrane. It's composed largely of cellulose, a polysaccharide sugar that provides strength to the cell wall. So if you've ever noticed how strong the bark of a tree is, that's because the bark is composed of dead cells uh, with really, really tough cell walls. The cell wall also grows within the cell, getting bigger and the cell, as the cell gets bigger. Although plants aren't the only organisms that have a cell wall, this structure is a characteristic of all plants. Uh, the cell wall serves many purposes. Its Popeye-like toughness provides great protection, strength, and shape to the cell, helping a plant to be both flexible and rigid. Uh, so think about a bouquet of roses. The stems are strong enough that you need a sharp knife to cut through them, but flexible enough that they fit easily into a vase. So the primary cell wall is relatively thin and flexible. The middle, uh, the middle lamella has a thin layer between primary walls of adjacent uh, cells. And the secondary cell wall, which is in some cells, um, have it added between the plasma membrane and the primary cell wall. The plasma desmata are channels between adjacent plant cells. So um, between uh, cells that, you know, cells are separated by cell walls, and then there's like this intermembrane space uh, that's called the plasma desmata. And you can see that here. Okay, vacuoles. So in addition to a cell wall, plant, wall uh, plant cells also have a very, very large structure that can take up as much as 75 to 85% of the cell's volume. And this is called the central vacuole. It's a large storage compartment in plant cells. Um, so what does the vacuole hold? Although other non-plant cells also have vacuoles, including animal cells, Plant cells have these large, really gigantic uh, central vacuoles that largely are a storage place for water. So while we have, um, or how our cells are about 70% water, plant cells are about 90% water, uh, and they need a place to put it. So in addition to water, though, vacuoles can also contain food and other nutrients as well as waste products. 
The central vacuole also contains digestive enzymes like those in animal cell, um, in lysosomes in animal cells. A central vacuole also maintains a neutral pH in the cell by pumping hydrogen atoms or protons from the cytoplasm into the vacuole. So what happens if you pump a lot of protons into the vacuole? It makes the plant cell more acidic, right? Um, which also is similar to a lysosome. So um, here you can see the large central vacuole. Um, if you look at the bottom picture, you see the nucleus, the cell wall, and the chloroplast, and the largest structure by far is the central vacuole. Food vacuoles are formed by uh, phagocytosis. There are contractile vacuoles found in many freshwater um, protists, which pump excess water out of the cells, and this actually helps them to move. Um, large central vacuoles found in many mature plant cells, um, and they hold organic compounds uh, and water. Okay, so how does the cell wall and the central vacuole relate to those plants that you forgot to water? So remember that cells transport water across their cell membranes through the process called osmosis. And so when you forget to water the plants, the plant cells are then, they become a hyper a hyper, I'm sorry, yeah, a hypertonic environment or an environment with less water around them um, and more solutes. So this causes water to leave the plant cells, right? Because it's through osmosis, they're going to an area of less concentration or down the concentration gradient. And this, um, the consequence of that is a wilting plant. But um, notice, however, that even in a hypertonic environment, the cell wall helps maintain the shape of that plant. So even though the water is leaving the cell and the cells are sort of deflating, the cell walls themselves holds up a lot of that structure in, those, in, the, in that plant. So as soon as you start watering the plant again regularly, the plants are again isotonic or equal, okay, water um, inside the cell as outside the cell. And then the cell's uh, central vacuole will take on that water and then the cell can fill the cells, uh, the wall shape again. So now what if you poured on a little too much water uh, to try to make up for last time? You may have seen a plant wilt when it isn't watered enough, but have you ever seen a plant explode with water? So probably not. Uh, that's because in a hypotonic environment where there's too much water, um, with more water outside of the cell than in, this, which you know puts pressure on the cell, the central vacuole swells with water, putting pressure on the cell walls. Uh, however, those cells, they keep pretty rigid and strong because of how strong the cell wall is, um, and it'll prevent that cell from bursting. So this pressure that is put on the cell wall is known as turgor pressure. In fact, most healthy plants are in a constant state of turgor pressure, and that is what gives plants rigid shapes. Okay, let's talk about chloroplasts. So chloroplasts capture um, light energy. It's a member of a family of organelles called plastids. Remember we talked about mitochondria in the last lesson, and they have these plasmids of DNA in, in, their, in their structure. Okay, organelles and um, chloroplasts are a member of a family called plastids. Chloroplasts contain the green pigment chlorophyll as well as enzymes and other molecules that function in photosynthesis. They're found in leaves and other green organs of plants and in algae. And the structure includes thycaloids, which are membranous, uh, membranous sacs, and the stroma, which is the internal fluid. Okay, thycaloid, the internal sacs. Look at that. Um, you can see the chloroplast DNA right here. It's like the plasmids that are in that are similar um, in mitochondria, right? Okay, so then the stroma is the liquid. Okay, this is the inner and outer membranes. So again, just like we talked about with the mitochondria, what's different about a chloroplast? So if you look at it, what internal structures does it possess that make it different from other organelles uh, that we've looked at? Okay, they have two membranes. Okay, that's similar to a mitochondria. They have small circular DNA, okay, here. And they have smaller ribosomes, interestingly. Thank you.
All right, so um, again, this is your Cambridge objective, and we are going to, um, in lab, we're gonna look at some of these bacteria. Okay, so let's talk about different types of cells. So you guys have already learned about this in STEM. We've been talking about it through the last three series of cell lectures, and now we're gonna talk more specifically about it and kind of give you a refresher on the topic. So there are two fundamentally different types of cells those with a nucleus and those without a nucleus. Prokaryotes or prokaryotes or prokaryotes are organisms that lack nuclei or any other membrane-bound organelle. All prokaryotes are classified into one or two domains. They're either bacteria or archaea. On average, about a thousand to ten thousand times smaller in volume than cells with, with a nuclei. And they are much, much smaller. Uh, and they're a very simple structure. So the DNA just lies free in the cytoplasm. And then you have eukaryotic cells, which possess a nuclei, so plant, fungi, and animal cells. The DNA lies within a nucleus. And eukaryotes are believed to have evolved from prokaryotic cells about 1,500 million years after prokaryotes first appeared. And we learned about that in the last lesson um, about mitochondria and chloroplasts. Okay, so the typical features of a prokaryotic cell, you have a uh, capsule. Um, well, let's talk about the structures that are, are always present. So depending on what type of prokaryote you have, there are structures that are always present and some that are sometimes present. So first, let's talk about the ones that are always present. So you always have a cell wall. You always have a cell surface membrane, a cytoplasm, circular DNA, which is sometimes referred to as the chromosome, and ribosomes. Okay, and then Sometimes you'll have a flagellum for locomotion, a capsule, which is a di a, an additional sort of protection, the infolding of a cell surface membrane. Okay, so this may form a photosynthetic, a photosynthetic membrane or carry out nitrogen fixation, depending on which type of uh, prokaryotic cell you're, you're looking at. A plasmid, which, might, which we know is a small circle of DNA. Several may be present, depending on the cell. And pili, or pili, for attachment to other cells. Uh, or surfaces involved in sexual reproduction as well. Okay, so here is a nice table that you need to memorize um, describing the, the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which we have uh, talked about. So remember that prokaryotes do not have a nucleus or any membrane bound organelles, which means that they do not have an ER. Okay, they have very few organelles. Um, and they, you know, they do have a cell wall, their DNA is naked, their DNA is circular and lies freely in the cytoplasm and they are very small. Okay, so look over this table. Okay, viruses. So unlike prokaryotes and eukaryotes, viruses do not have a cell structure. In other words, they are not surrounded by a partially permeable membrane containing cytoplasm with ribosomes. They are really much simpler in structure. Most viruses only consist of self-replicating molecule of DNA or RNA, which acts as its genetic code, and a protective coat of protein molecules. So let's look at a structure. So it, uh, viruses are very symmetrical. Its protein coat uh, is called a capsid, and it's made up of a separate protein molecule, each of which is called a capsomere. Viruses range in size from about 20 to 30 nanometers. All viruses are parasitic because they can only reproduce by infecting and taking over other living cells. The virus DNA or RNA takes over the protein synthesizing machinery of a host cell, which then helps to make new virus um, particles on its own. And so if you carry on to the A-level portion of biology, we'll talk about evolution uh, and a fascinating um, relationship between uh, viruses and human evolution. Okay, so that is it for Cells Part 3. Thank you for watching.